Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Today, we are joined by Chef Magnus Dielsen, head chef of <laughs> Favikin, which is a hyper-local restaurant in the wilds of Sweden. It is currently ranked number 25 in the world's best restaurant list. He is the author of a cookbook by the same name, Favikin, as well as the Nordic cookbook, which is for sale today. And he has appeared on Mind of a Chef on PBS mm -hmm. and Netflix's Chef's Table. I'm going to hand it over to the man you're here to see. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. So this is really exciting. <laughs> um, so I've written this book, The Nordic uh, Cookbook, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Nordic food culture in general first, and then uh, continue by talking a little bit about how the book was put together. Um, one thing with the Nordic region is that most people don't really know what it is. And that's one of the reasons why I have kind of wrote this book, actually. And I've done, through these events, I've done uh, kind of a little, a little study. Uh, so there's going to be a raise of hands now. How many people in this room can tell the difference, like with certainty, between the Nordic region and Scandinavia? One down there, two. And one that's doing this, that's two and a half. <laughs> Uh, it's usually about 10%, so that was a little bit below average, actually. <laughs> um, so Scandinavia is uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and nothing else. And the Nordics is Scandinavia plus Finland in the east, and a little island called Åland in between Finland and Sweden, and the Faroe Islands, and Iceland, and Greenland also. So it's a huge geographical area. Uh, you can see it all here. And that's one of the defining factors on Nordic culture and definitely also Nordic food culture is that it's such a big area. And in a big area, naturally, you have lots of diversity as well. Um, one thing with the uh, Nordic region also, it's, it's a geographical construction. It's not a homogenous cultural region, probably because it is so big. Um, someone basically sat down in an office sometime and decided that all of these countries here, depending on who made war with who, they are just one region now. <laughs> Um, but you know, you can imagine that, like going to, for example, the southeast of Finland is going to be quite different to, you know, Greenland, for example. So, um, I get quite often I get the, the question um, when we talk about this book about uh, Nordic dishes or pan-Nordic dishes, dishes that would exist in the whole region. And the thing is that there aren't any of those. Like, there are no dishes that look the same throughout this whole region. Uh, and one of the few things that actually tie the regions together is the seasons. It's the fact that we have four defined seasons. And one of them, the winter, is a season where you can't harvest anything, at least no plant foods. So all of these regions, historically, uh, you had to um, produce an excess of food in summer, and store it, prepare it some way, and then consume it in winter. And obviously, these days, you know, no one has to do that anymore. You can import food, and we can refrigerate, and we can freeze, and we can do all kinds of things. But it's still something that's a defining factor in the way we eat and the preferences that we have for food in the Nordic region. And one example of uh, a dish that's as close to a pan-Nordic dish as you get, and also a great example of uh, a dish that uses sort of these things, uh, the, the defining factor that you have to store food for winter, is the open sandwich. You know, a piece of bread with toppings. And then we don't put the second unnecessary slice of bread that you guys do on top, but you know, the open sandwich. And like <clears throat> the interesting thing with that, if you start looking at the bread, is that obviously it's made from grains. Grains is one of the most convenient ways of storing solar energy from summer into you know, the dark months of the year. Uh, it doesn't go bad, it's very, very stable, it has good shelf life, and it's easy to process into many, many things. Um, the bread also says quite a lot about the circumstances of where it's produced. And we can start by looking at the loaf, for example. Like a loaf of bread, which is an everyday staple in large parts of the world today, is actually kind of a luxury item. It's a, you know, it needs very special circumstances to be like, produced and to become an everyday staple. Um, and in the Nordic region, you'll have like loaves of bread historically as the base of sandwiches, basically from a line 
around Stockholm somewhere and then through South Sweden, a little bit in South Norway and then through Denmark. And why is this then? Um, two reasons. One is that it's the only parts of the Nordic region who are truly urban, meaning that you have enough population density so that you can actually have bakeries. Because if you're going to eat slices cut from a loaf of bread, you want to have it pretty fresh at least, like if not daily fresh, at least not more, more than a couple of days old. And if you think that modern transportation hasn't really been efficient enough to move around foods for more than you know, 60 or 70 or perhaps 100 years, um, which is a very, very small um, perspective in historical terms. Another thing with uh, the loaf is that if you're going to bake loaf, at least if you're not using a tin for like a rye loaf, you have to have wheat flour, high gluten wheat flour, preferably, because otherwise it doesn't rise. And wheat doesn't really grow that much in the Nordic region. It pretty much grows in that same area that I just described, you know, the south parts of Sweden and Denmark and a little bit in southern Norway. Um, if, you, if you look at other parts, like where I grew up, there is no wheat, so very difficult to make loaves. There is also much less people. Uh, today, where I, where I live, it's, um, the population is one person per square kilometer. <laughs> Meaning that you know bakeries aren't very very common. Like there is one city in my region; it's the size of Denmark, the whole the whole region, you know, a sixth of the surface of Sweden. One bakery, one city. Um, because of this, people have a completely different bread baking tradition. Instead of having bakeries and bread becoming a staple, uh, you know, people going out to buy their bread on a daily basis, everyone had their own baking ovens instead, and to heat the baking oven like with firewood. It's pretty expensive because you use a lot of firewood and there's also a lot of work involved. It takes several days to heat it up to a proper baking temperature. And because of this, people didn't bake very often. So like baking up north was considered more of a kind of activity you did maybe twice a year, maybe even once a year. And it was really only a way of um, processing those grains so that they became more easy to eat. So what people used to do was to uh, fire up that big baking oven, like let's say mid-November, um, turn their dried grains into uh, flour, predominantly barley is what we use, and then start by making thin flatbreads, like two millimeter thin, about this size, eight to centimeters in diameter, and cook them at really high heat, like 800 degrees Celsius, for half a minute. And then you take them out and they dry really quickly. And when they're dried, you can just stack them, and you can keep them for a very, very long time. And they're consumed basically by, you break off a piece and you put some butter on, a slice of cheese, and you eat it like a sandwich. Or you can just crumble it into like cultured milk or a broth or something like that. And after they made these uh, dried flatbreads, they would continue doing soft flatbreads, which is pretty much the same thing, just a little bit thicker, and cooked at a slightly lower temperature because the oven has cooled a little bit. Uh, and that was considered something, yeah, like a, a seasonal thing, you know, something you ate only when you were baking because they don't keep very well. These days you can buy them all the time because we freeze them, so it's kind of different. Um, going on after this, people would continue by doing the loaves. And because the loaf, you know, because of the fact that you have to eat it fresh and people didn't bake on a very regular basis, it was considered a luxury item instead of in the, like in the South, an everyday commodity. And because of this, like as with many of the things that we really f uh, find special, we tried to make them even more special. So people added everything that was expensive to their loaves. And in this case, quite often, like lots of sugar and lots of spices. So the further north you go, in Scandinavia at least, the sweeter the loaves and the more seasoned. Like you'll have a hard time finding a traditional recipe from Denmark or South Sweden that has any uh, sugar or spices at all in it, actually. And it's, it's even like, like I remember my grandma's um, rye loaves when I grew up, they were almost basically like an eggless sponge cake with gingerbread seasoning. Very, very, very sweet. Can continue looking at um, uh, other parts of the, the Nordics as well. Like uh, Norway, they have pretty much the same flatbread tradition as Sweden does, but they don't have as many trees. 
because they have a pretty harsh uh, coastal climate in the north. So they figured out more energy efficient ways to, to cook their flatbreads um, than firing up that big baking oven. And quite often in Norway we find that the bread is cooked on like a heated flat stone or a piece of sheet iron or something like that with a fire underneath instead. And you can continue going on to Iceland, which is where this is photographed. And on Iceland, they don't have any trees at all almost. Um, and because of this, um, they don't have a tradition of baking ovens either. But what they do have is thermally active areas and volcanic areas. And quite often you'll find like just outside of the village centers, if you have a, like a hot springs area or something like that, people have like a little spot where every house in the village have their own hole in the ground with a little lid. Um, and you go there in the evening with your rye bread dough in a bucket, and you put it down in the hole, put the lid on, and you come back in the morning um, to pick your steamed loaf out. And this is something that's been going on since forever, and it's pretty cool that it's still happening. And as far as I know, it's the only example of steamed bread like historically found in Europe. So this is, that was a little bit about the base, the bread, you know, the base of the sandwich. And you can con continue looking at the toppings as well, which is something that perhaps says even more about the culture and uh, the circumstances in the areas where the sandwiches are produced. Uh, this photo here, it's taken in a restaurant in Copenhagen called Schönemann, which is like one of the most traditional Danish style open faced sandwich restaurants. Uh, and you can see the sandwiches here, like they're super rich, there's so much toppings, like you can't even like pick that sandwich up and eat it. You have to eat it from a plate with cutlery. And it says quite a lot about Denmark as a country. Historically being like the only land connection between the Nordics and Central Europe, loads of trade went through Denmark. And it's also a very rich agricultural country, lots of farming, uh, which really shows, I think, in like the way the sandwiches are eaten. Going up to where I live, you know, much poorer, less population density, uh, harsher climate. As I said before, the sandwich is more likely to be like a, a piece of thin crisp bread with some butter and cheese and something you probably eat standing up rather than sitting down like this with beer and aquavit and stuff. Um, same goes like, for example, with a Sami family because they also have a, a type of flatbreads being semi-nomadic. They don't have access to baking ovens. Um, but they also cooked on, um, on flat stones that they carried with them when they moved around. Uh, and they probably wouldn't even put the topping on the sandwich, but rather have it on the side, like eating bread and toppings next to each other. So this photo here is from the Faroe Islands. And here you can see like a very clear influence on the bread, bread side of things from Denmark, because the Faroe Islands is a self-governed uh, self part of Denmark. Um, <laughs> They have a completely different topping culture. This here is called the rast, and it's quite unique to, uh, to the North Atlantic island communities, uh, this, way, this way of preparing, uh, preparing meat. Because the thing is there that since, like before modern shipping, they didn't have access to salt in big sheep quantities like we've had in Europe for a long, long, long time. Um, simply because it was too uh, cold to evaporate it in sultans like you would in Spain or Italy or something like that, and not enough fuel to fuel salt pans like they did, for example, in the British Islands. Uh, so all the salt was imported, which was very expensive, and it was pretty much only used for seasoning. Um, so you'll find that almost all of the preservation methods that, that are used, they are saltless. And in almost all the other Western cultures, we rely heavily on salt to um, induce lactobacillus fermentation, produce lactic acid, and thereby producing uh, safe foods. And this is something that we see still today, like you know, people don't think about it, but all kinds of cheese, olives, charcuterie, pretty much everything that's umami rich and savory relate, relies on that salt uh, to, uh, to actually become what it is. Um, and not having enough salt to do that on the Faroe Islands, people instead figure out other ways to control their microbiological flora in their meats. And one way is to just take your mutton when it's slaughtered, hang it in these houses that are called jallur, which are latticed, uh, and letting the very special climate that you have on the Faroe Islands work on them, because it's located in the middle of the Gulf Stream. Uh, so the climate is very stable all around the year, pretty much the same temperature, same humidity all the time. Um, and this, together with other local circumstances, produces 
really good growing conditions for certain types of mold, for example. Uh, and instead of just rotting and decaying, it actually preserves the meat. But you have to be tuned in to those flavors, because for us, most Westerners, uh, the reason we like, for example, mature cheese or ham or something like that is simply because we've been taught through generations that that's the flavor of safe foods. You know, it's a preservation technique that's going to not kill you, basically. <laughs> um, eating rust is like the other way around. Your body actually tells you that this is going to kill you. <laughs> it smells like, you know, uh, rotting meat, dead, basically. And even if you look at 10 other people, 10 fairies people standing around you, obviously still being alive, eating the meat. It's a kind of a conscious struggle to put in your mouth. It's very, it's very interesting, actually, because most often, at least not to me, uh, there is no struggle to put things in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if they don't top their sandwiches with rust, uh, there are a good chance that they'll do it with uh, uh, pretty much the only thing that grows on the Faroe Islands that you can turn into marmalade, which is rhubarb, uh, which is also true for Iceland. Like, there are no berries growing on either Iceland or the Faroe Islands, pretty much. Um, and rhubarb is really popular. It contains a lot of vitamin C, which traditionally was very difficult to come by up there. On Iceland, also being a North Atlantic island community, they uh, do a lot of uh, the same kind of saltless preservation techniques that you'll find on the Faroe Islands as well. Uh, but they also smoke quite a lot of meat. And they do it in smokehouses like this. And Iceland as Fair Islands have very, very few trees. And there are several reasons for this. Like one is that obviously it's very remote, so there are not as many seeds blowing around in the wind. Another is that the the climate is harsh. And the third and most important one is that they have sheep everywhere that eat all the saplings. Um, and sheep they also produce shit, which is collected to fuel these smokehouses. Which is pretty 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 special. <laughs> Um, I know. So enough talking about um, sandwiches as a cultural marker, even though I think it's very, very interesting. Like it says so much about where it's, where it's eaten. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how the book was put together and why. Um, initially, I wasn't very keen on doing this book. And I was quite offended when I was asked, actually, because I'm Swedish. And as most people living in the Nordic region, I identify myself uh, with the place I live rather than you know the region as a whole. So I'm Swedish, not Nordic. Uh, and I, I thought it was a bit strange to take all of these different cultures and putting them in one book and labeling that with something. It was a bit like taking you know, some German, some Portuguese food culture, some Italian, and like some French, and it's putting that in one book and calling it the European cookbook. Um, and after a while, like after uh, maybe a couple of weeks of discussions with the publisher, because I wanted to do a completely different book, I wanted to do a Swedish book. <laughs> um, but after a, a couple of weeks of discussions with the, uh, the publisher, uh, I realized two things. One was that the very reason I didn't want to do it was why it should be done, because most people don't know what the region is, let alone what the food culture looks like. And this is also something that applies for people living in the region. So it's not, it's not just people here in the US, for example. Very few people in the whole world knows what Nordic uh, cooking looks like, except for those very obvious dishes like the herrings and the meatballs and grab laxes and stuff like that. Um, and the other reason was simply that the publisher had clearly decided that there was going to be an Nordic cookbook. And if I didn't do it, someone else was going to do it. <laughs> I didn't want that. Um, so the purpose of this book was really to explain like what Nordic food culture looks like, how all of these different food cultures come together, but also how they differ. Um, and that was kind of the, 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 the whole idea from the very beginning. Uh, and I also wanted the book to be a doc documentation of what the food culture looks like today. Because it's very easy when writing a book like this sort of that it turns into um, uh, kind of some ide idealized fairy tale version of food culture. Um, and that's not very interesting. And it's not very accurate either. Um, so the book contains a little bit of historical dishes that no one is going to cook, I think. <laughs> Perhaps 50, something like that. Uh, but they're still important because they explain something about food culture. And they're important for at least some people within the region. But the vast majority of recipes in the book, they are really the recipes that are used on an everyday basis in most Nordic homes. And that has also meant that there's been quite a lot of uh, 
dishes that there were debate around whether they were actually Nordic or not. And this is one of them, which is, uh, I just heard, also served in the cafe today here. Um, like what defines a regional specialty is really difficult to, uh, to, to decide, actually, and who's to decide that, like who, who is the decider of those things. Um, I think that like, some, one of the most interesting things with doing the research for the book for me, it was to figure out like, how all of these dishes that have been created over the last 20 or 30 years actually you know, was invented and why they made, made sense then and why some of them still make sense. And the taco kish is, a, is an interesting example uh, because it's the definition to me of a regional specialty. And I'm going to try to explain why. Uh, so the, the, the idea of the taco, the concept of the taco, it came to Sweden like in the late 80s or early 90s. And it was brought by spice companies who wanted to sell spice mix, taco kits. And it wasn't very, like, it's not authentic, you know. Uh, it's like bastardized Tex-Mex tacos. Um, but they became really popular. Like, I remember growing up having tacos at my house made from moose, mince, and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, and the, the interesting thing with uh, something that becomes really popular and you know, something that people start doing on a kind of bigger scale is that after a while, it becomes boring. And when it becomes boring is actually when the really interesting stuff starts to happen. Because that's when people dare changing things. And that's when people start to adapt to um, their own preferences and to the local circumstances, ending up with dishes like, for example, the taco quiche, like a merge between uh, you know, the bastardized Tex-Mex taco kit and a traditional Swedish meat pie, basically. So what defines the regional specialty? Um, we can look at different sort of, um, we can compare two dishes and we can look at different um, sort of critical points to them. Um, there is one dish called surströmming in Sweden, sour herring. Has anyone heard about that? Yeah, a few people. <laughs> uh, so the sour herring is, um, if you ask a bunch of Swedes to name one Swedish dish, quite a few of them are going to say sour herring, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, the sour herring is um, the world's stinkiest food. It's not immediately pleasurable. Keep that in mind now. OK, so if we look at the two dishes, um, produced in the region could be a factor defining whether something is a regional specialty or not. Like all of these foods here, the store-bought salsa, medium hot, that's definitely produced in Sweden. That's produced in Sweden, and those nachos are also produced in Sweden. Um, the sour herring is fished in the Baltics, fermented in Sweden. So they, there are no differences there. So that's not a defining factor anymore. Uh, the history, so the taco kisha, you know, we know that it's been around for 25 years or something like that, maybe a little bit longer. So that's a very short time in a historical perspective. And most people think maybe that the sour herring has been around for a really long time. But if we look at what it is, so it's a fish fermented with salt. And that's not very Swedish. That's something that's been done all across the whole world. It exists in almost every food culture in some way. Uh, what makes it unique, though, is that it's first fermented in a barrel, a barrel, and then it's transferred to a tin can and left to do a second fermentation in the tin can. The tin can, it was invented in the late 19th century and popularized in the early 20th century. Um, or, sorry, it was invented in the, in the um, or it was popularized in the early uh, 20th century, right? Um, meaning that, like, the dish as such, it can't really be much older than that. So it's like 100 years, which is also a really short perspective in historical terms. So that's not a defining factor either. And then we have cultural importance. Um, with food, cultural importance is quite easy to measure, because it's just about how often and how much it is consumed. And if you take 100 Swedes and you put them in one big row and you ask, like, how many of you guys eat sour herring? Maybe 20 are going to say yes. And if you then ask those 20, how often do you eat sour herring? Like, I don't think you're going to find many that do it more than once a year. If you ask the same 100 Swedes, how many of you guys eat taco quiche? It's going to be way more than 20. Um, and it's quite likely they're going to eat it also way more often than once a year. So which is the most Swedish dish? You know? um, and it's quite interesting if you go into uh, 
uh, going onto the internet and you start looking at like how much information there is about certain things because one thing with these more recent recipes is that all that information on like when they were created and how they have developed it's there it's very accessible um, as opposed to the more historical recipes let's say those that were invented before you know 1920 because they are already defined by someone else someone has said what they are because they've been defined in uh, in literature basically uh, when someone recorded like traditional recipes and then they haven't changed much um, but with these more recent dishes you can really look you can see like there's another recipe which is called kladdkaka which is also really popular in Sweden it's uh, another unique regional specialty and you can follow its development from when it was first published in 1970 something up until today and you can see how it changed a little bit you know with the passing of time to kind of enhance the the things with it that we like the most and you can also use uh, that to see like how much people actually consume and how important it is for the popular culture and the three most or the two most um, common recipe searches on the internet from Sweden on uh, different uh, different Swedish dishes is actually Kladdkaka is the most common one 750,000 hits um, the population with 9.6 million people is you know a, a lot of a lot of Kladdkaka recipes um, and the second most uh, popular one is actually the taco kish with 175,000 hits that's way more than like meatballs and cabbage rolls and stuff like that that's perhaps considered more Swedish in a traditional perspective I started traveling around all the all the Nordics um, and collecting recipes basically interviewing people like looking at what was previously published and basically trying to accumulate as much information as possible and at the same time that this was happening we also had a web-based poll out where people could report in and submit recipes and also answer to um, different questions about how they looked and their own food culture uh, which was very interesting because it turns out that the way people see their own food culture is very different from how it actually is. <laughs> uh, very few people said that taco kish was a common Swedish everyday dish. Uh, most people come up with things like pan fried salted herring and things like that that are definitely Swedish but that are eaten very very rarely. Uh, the next step was to um, compile an index to start sifting through all of these recipes and to create something that was as representative as possible for as big a part of the region as possible. Uh, and then they had this index sent out, it had like 750 recipes in it, had it sent out to one uh, expert in each region or country uh, to be reviewed and like take away everything that was superfluous and add things that were missing and to correct all the spelling errors and you know all of those things. Um, when the index came back I started writing the material and formatting the recipes into something that was sort of relatively consistent and after that the whole material went at, uh, went back out again to those same experts and all of them are like just ordinary people with a very big uh, knowledge on their own food cultures there are no chefs involved or anything and they could review the whole material again and send it back with more feedback uh, collecting more spelling errors especially in Finnish <laughs> Um, when that was done, the kind of last step to put together the content was to send the whole book to um, a guy named Richard Telström, and he's an associate professor in um, ethnology, specializing in the meal as a cultural marker. Uh, and he made sure that all of the things were actually correct, like all of the <laughs> dates and stuff like that. When the content was done, I started testing recipes and I tested about 400 of the 730 something recipes uh, in my house in, a, in my normal sort of uh, kitchen and this for example it's uh, lutefisk and all the different condiments to lutefisk all through the Nordic region. Um, here you have some split pea soup, a bit of a spinach, a few spinach dishes and like one thing that's really important when writing a book like this that's aimed to explain like not just to give recipes but also to explain like a cultural context and to explain why things make sense and you know how they came up to be and, and stuff like that is to um, try to avoid all assumed knowledge and that's really difficult especially when you think that you know a lot about something um, 
and we, we had to work very, very hard with this. And one of the steps to uh, try to avoid the soup knowledge was to send uh, different dishes or different recipes out to testers. So we had about 100 recipes in the book that were sent out to testers all over the world. Um, and it was quite fascinating to see how much came back. So I'll have one example here. Um, <clears throat> so this, this was supposed to be a, a Swedish layer cake. And they shouldn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is that like, this is actually everything that I wrote in this recipe. It's been perfectly executed, like exactly the way I wrote it. Uh, the cake has been baked the same way, all the fillings are made the same way, the berries are handled the same way and all that. And I just like, forgot to include one thing and that made it whole, like, this whole recipe kind of just not function. I forgot to say how to assemble it. Yeah. Because to me it's so obvious, there's only one way of doing it. Like, there's one way of doing a layer cake. Um, this is another example. This looks pretty good, actually, um, but it's wrong. And the thing here, this is uh, from an American recipe tester. Uh, and the thing here is that it turns out that the round cake tins in the US, there are 25 millimeters smaller in diameter than the standard round cake tins in Sweden. So this cake is like 50% too high. Um, you know, and it, it's still a good cake and all that, but it looks not, nothing like it you know, should, basically. Yeah. And here, actually, this is actually a recipe where I don't, I don't know what happened there. That's totally wrong. Um, <laughs> because I, I still haven't figured out what I did wrong when I wrote the instructions for this. But this was supposed to be a pickled herring. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so that's the uh, Nordic cookbook. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Are there any questions? Do you want to become a recipe tester? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if Peter at Fighting can answer that. I also don't know the answer. I guess that you just uh, sort of maybe uh, uh, email a publishing company and say that you want to start testing recipes. <laughs> the thing is that there are professional recipe testers. And some of the recipes, like because they know exactly what to look for, like what to try to find what's wrong. Um, and about half of the recipes that we tried out, they were tested by professional recipe testers, and the other half was tested by just ordinary people who someone found somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, there? How much traveling did you do for this? Um, Just repeat the questions if you don't have a mic on them. Yeah. Um, so, how much traveling did I do for the book? Um, the, the whole process of producing the book was about three years. And the first two years, I traveled pretty much everywhere I could in the Nordic region. Uh, and I don't know how many days or anything like that, but a lot. Uh, because, uh, as I might have mentioned before, there's not a single recipe in there that's actually mine. They've all been collected somewhere by, from someone who actually uses them in their home, which was a really important part of the book. So. And also because I photographed all of the, uh, the whole book when I was out traveling as well. And that's something that like, you couldn't you couldn't commission someone to do that, because then you wouldn't get all those little moments you know, that happens when you're out traveling. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of traveling. Have any of the recipes or ideas found their way back into your restaurant? There, there are definitely, you know, so the question was if any of the ideas have found their back, uh, way back into the restaurant. And um, definitely, like, and I think that's going to be even more of that later, because the thing when if you have a, like a, a creative profession, I think what you produce is kind of a composite of everything that you have with you. And this being a very, very large part of my kind of daily routine for the last three years, it obviously becomes a big part of also what I produce at the restaurant. But I think there's going to be like for several years to come more and more, you know, showing through the menu. Well, um, I have a really good team. <laughs> and Faviken is not quite as small as most people think it is. Because there are actually, so I have 47 employees in total, and 21 of them work in the restaurant. And uh, they are the people who like, execute the, the restaurant on a, on a daily basis. So, and people, people tend to think with chefs that you know, it's this one guy, and he's like, doing all of this stuff. And then it's actually quite a big company, and like, lots of people that all work together to produce the dining experience. And I'm just a 
kind of a small part of the execution, even though um, kind of sort of a bigger part of the uh, creative process and like the quality control process. So uh, al alcoholic beverages in general is something you find everywhere. Uh, and people tend to take whatever sugars they have historically and turn them into alcohol that they can drink. Um, beer in the Nordic region is not, like we, have, we don't have a huge beer culture. People think that we do because we drink a lot of beer and have done so for the last 100 years. <laughs> um, but it's not like, um, because grains up there, there is kind of on the margin where grain grows. So grain was usually used for bread or for porridge and things like that. Uh, and maybe historically it was more mead, the only source of, uh, of sugar basically that you had up there. Um, and the beer culture has probably come from Central Europe during the last 100, 200 years, something like that. Um, and you'll, you'll, you can see in the whole region as well, like the way we consume um, alcohol. Um, there is one distinctive part that is kind of beer and one that's hard liquor being like, you know, kind of belt across uh, Finland and Sweden, you'll have a, a bigger consumption of hard liquor tr traditionally, um, mainly produced from potato or, you know, some kind of grain. Uh, and then like Denmark and up through the uh, island nations, you'll have more of a beer culture. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Huh?